just to introduce our next speaker, he's uh, uh, Bob Edwards from Research School of Computer Science at Australian National University. Um, he's part of Machine Learning in Multiple Era Project. Or yeah, yeah. Yep. Yep. Um, today's talking about a Net FPGA USB 2.0 interface for that project. Do I use that microphone or this? Okay, thank you. So um, thanks for coming along and I uh, also want to say thanks to the paper committee for selecting this paper out of very, very many. I hear a lot, lot were turned down. Uh, when I put in my paper proposal, I put a couple in actually, but when for this one I uh, outlined a whole lot of different things I could talk about and said if you want me to talk about a particular aspect of the project uh, in more detail to fit in with the theme of the conference or whatever, let me know, and they didn't. So I'm going to talk about the whole the whole thing, which means I'm going to go a bit quickly and only touch on a few things, which I'd like to perhaps talk about a bit more if I had more time. Um, so that's an out, an overview. So I work with the Computer Systems Research Group in the Research School of Computer Science, which is just across the creek here on the other side of the Pickle Pickle. And I've been there for, I don't know, 13 years or so. Um, I teach computer networking and also um, co-teach a free and open source software development course with Dr. Andrew Tridgell, otherwise known as Tridge at Samba.org, and also teach co-teach the operating systems course with Dr. Eric McCreeth, who is not here, was going to be here. Um, so do a bit of teaching. And the other half of my time I spend as a senior research engineer and uh, one of the things that our group's interested in is low power and low cost clustering. And uh, we've been looking at building um, clusters out of system on chip or system on module um, machines based on ARM CPUs. <coughs> and uh, I guess the, the key one we've been uh, looking at about a year ago when I started working on this project was the NVIDIA Tegra 2 which has now been superseded by the Tegra 3 and probably the Tegra 4 for all I know. Um, but the Tegra 2 is the one I'm kind of more familiar with. And our idea is to build clusters of these using um, common off-the-shelf, or commodity off-the-shelf gigabit switches with P power over Ethernet, PoE. So the idea is to build little sub-clusters of um, systems on chips interconnected together with their USB and then tie those back to ports on the gigabit switch over gigabit networking which also will provide power to the um, to the ARM the ARM devices and their, uh, their interconnect. <coughs> and so that takes us to the USB to gig E switch of which um, the thing I'm talking about today uh, is a part so first I want to talk very quickly about USB and networking. Um, so we have lots of commercially available USB to network adapters available with uh, Linux support. Um, mainly 100 base TX uh, and there are some gigabit ones available as well. Uh, and inside Linux kernel there's a infrastructure called USB Net which provides generic support across a whole range of these adapters. So about USB, it's a bus, uh, usually a tree-shaped type bus. Um, has one host and multiple peripheral devices, one or more, and the peripheral devices are joined to the host via hubs. Um, the host is in control of all transfers, and it's a, um, it's not CSMA CD, but it is, it's, it's strictly one device is signaling at a time, so the host controls who gets to talk on the bus at any particular time. Um, so it's not full duplex. Uh, USB 2.0 signals at up to 480, well, at 480 megabits a second or at the lower speeds to be compatible with USB 1.1. That's 60 megabytes per second raw. Uh, in theory, you can pro possibly, if you really work hard, get 48 megabytes per second of real data across a single USB 2 channel if um, nothing else is there and if everything's optimised to max. On your hand, 100 megabits Ethernet can transfer around 12 megabytes per second each way, full duplex. Gigabit Ethernet can do about 120 megabytes per second each way. So for a 100 megabits um, to USB 2 adapter, 
Um, it's 100 megabit Ethernet, which becomes a bottleneck because um, its its aggregate bandwidth is 24 megabytes per second, which is still less than the um, possible up to 48 megabytes per second of USB 2. When you go to a gig E adapter, the uh, USB 2 becomes a bottleneck. Um, USB 2 uh, gig E can go significantly faster than USB 2, <coughs> which is why you mainly see 100 megabit adapters for USB 2. Um, people say there's no, no point putting gigabit adapters in because you can't get gigabit, gigabit out of USB 2. But my argument is the opposite, that you can actually do better than 100 megabit, so why not use gigabit? Because it's better than 100 megabit, you can get better bandwidth. Okay, well USB 2 has a 125 microsecond microframe time, so the host or the controller polls all of the peripheral devices on its tree um, every microframe, every 125 microseconds. Um, and so therefore, for a network interface, you've got an automatic 125 microsecond latency because when a packet arrives in your USB network adapter, the host may not be coming around to poll for that packet or for, for that data from that device um, for up to 125 microseconds. So that's a bit of a bottleneck. Um, causes uh, performance issues. USB itself can transfer data in one of three modes, isochronous, bulk or interrupt. Um, isochronous guarantees a certain amount of bandwidth, but it's up to 24 megabytes per second over USB 2. Um, interrupt is for very small packets like mouse or keyboard events, those sorts of things. And bulk basically allows you to transfer as much as you want in unused um, capacity on the bus. So if you've got one device that's using bulk, then it gets all the bus. And bulk is what you'd use for your um, USB, net, uh, USB storage devices, your your um, flash device and your external hard drive and it's also what most of the network adapters use so they can basically use up all of the spare bus capacity as it's available and so for each of these microframes over bulk you can max out it for about 6,000 bytes of data okay Ethernet frames vary from 64 to 1522 I said 1522 because that's uh, the max size of a standard frame with one um, VLAN tag on it, but these days people are putting two and three layers of VLAN tags in, so it might be a bit bigger than that even, but it's only four bytes each. For each VLAN tag, it's only other four bytes, so it's not very significant. So therefore you can fit between uh, 93 and 4 Ethernet frames per USB 2 microframe, depending on what size Ethernet frames you're using. Uh, and therefore to make best use of your USB space or your, your, your microframe time, you want to pack multiple Ethernet frames if possible into each uh, USB 2 microframe. So uh, if you're only sending one Ethernet frame during each USB 2 microframe, you're not utilising your uh, Ethernet or your USB to the max. And so there's very standards for doing that and the, probably the, the uh, the one that's been adopted by the industry these days is called the Network Communications Model, or NCM, um, which allows chaining a whole lot of Ethernet frames together into one USB 2 bulk transfer uh, per microframe. <coughs> so that's just a bit of background about USB and networking. There's some issues to do with latency. There are issues to do with how to encapsulate multiple um, Ethernet frames into each USB frame and there are issues to do with uh, how you best um, join the different bandwidths together. <coughs> so our, uh, well my proposal is to build a, gig e a device that looks like a gigabit ethernet switch on one side and has um, between 4 and 8 USB 2.0 peripheral device ports coming out the other side. Um, and use a standard, the standard Ethernet learning switch fabric in between. So those who went to uh, Radio's um, keynote on Tuesday will have learned a lot about Ethernet switching, uh, and so I don't need to talk much more about that. If you didn't go to it, go and watch the video later. It was an excellent keynote. <coughs> so um, USB 2, in using the sorts of devices I'm using, we can get up to around about 41 megabytes a second bulk transfers. Um, so that's a pretty good, having four of those, four USB 2 interfaces feeding into a single gig e interface is a reasonably good impedance match. Um, if the four USB ports were all 
transferring in one direction at the same time to a destination at the other end of the gigabit ethernet, then they would actually saturate the gig E. Um, there would be some contention and some lost frames and whatnot. Um, but that's a, a, a bit of a corner case, unlikely to occur. Um, if you think of how a switch works, the USB 2 devices may actually be talking with each other and therefore not, the traffic may not be going across the gig E, um, or there might be bi-directional traffic between the um, USB devices and the destinations at the other end. And so gig E is bi-directional, so it actually can do 240 megabytes per second in aggregate. And there's a picture which <laughs> has not transferred across to my Mac version of LibreOffice, so I'm sorry about that. I could probably draw it if I have time, which I probably don't. Um, so think of a 48 port gigabit switch. Um, category 6 patch lead coming out of that into a little box and then um, four system on modules hanging around that, uh, each one hooked up with USB 2.0. <coughs> okay, so the Gigi 2E switch um, uses power over Ethernet. The original power over Ethernet standard um, calls for uh, being able to deliver up to 15.4 watts at the port and by the time you've hung that off 100 metres of Cat6 cable uh, with the resistance of the cable and stuff, um, the standard is supposed to guarantee that there's 12.95 or 13 watts of power available at the other end. We're not going to be using 100, megabit ca 100 metre cables, so um, you know, over one metre cable, probably all of the 15.4 watts will be available. The Tegra 2 system of modules that we're looking at, which have a gigabyte of RAM on them, consume 2.5 watts each. So we're budgeting for four of those modules for 10 watts and then there's th three watts, between three and five watts left over for the switch fabric, which would be um, the gigabit network port itself, which is actually quite power hungry. Gigabit networking is uh, use, generally uses a reasonable amount of power just because of the, vol the voltages and um, signalling involved and the switch fabric and the USB transceivers, of course. And so the intention is to realise that with an FPGA and some transceivers, a gigabit network transceiver and four USB 2 transceivers. <coughs> we could also realise this with a gig, a USB, uh, sorry, we could alternatively realise this with a five port um, gig switch you can buy down at Officeworks for 50 bucks or off the net for a bit less, I guess, and then just hang a, a gigabit to net USB 2 uh, adapter or four of those ports and have one port left over the uplink and modify it for power over Ethernet. That might work. The problem is is that you've now got um, a total of nine gigabit network ports to be powered instead of well actually, f yeah, because you're powering all the system modules off the same power over Ethernet. And so those nine gigabit network ports are going to use a lot of power. So by doing it with a FPGA and the transceivers, we're hoping to save a lot of power by not having to transfer things into gigabit domain and back out again for each of the system on modules, system on module devices. Okay, so that's where we got up to, and then we need a development platform in order to be able to realise this. And so uh, the, I was also aware of the NetFPGA platform from other work I was doing. Uh, NetFPGA is a project from Stanford University. Um, there's also a lot of work done on it from a um, bunch of researchers in Cambridge University. Um, these days they talk about the, the, um, the key words to look for are open flow and software defined routing are the sort of the big terms that are being used by these research groups uh, when, they, when they talk about what they're doing and go looking for money. Um, but NetFPGA is, is a, a set of hardware platforms that they've come up with. <coughs> so there's two platforms that are currently being used. The NetFPGA 1G, which uses the Ver Xilinx Vertec 2 Pro 50 um, FPGA, which has been deprecated by Xilinx some time ago. And uh, that's what I've got here. So this is a NetFPGA 1G. There are four 1G network ports over here. Uh, the Vertex 2 Pro uh, FPGA underneath there. Uh, there's another FPGA just here, which is used for PCI interface, also as a Xilinx device. And there's a Broadcom 
uh, four four channel giggy transceiver chip. There's also some RAM, uh, some Dynamic RAM, and some uh, quasi static RAM. There's two SATA ports over there. And the interesting thing also is this 40 pin uh, 0.1 inch spacing uh, connector at the top here, which is most of the pins are connected directly to pins off the the NetFPGA here. And that says there's a little thing on it saying debug connector, or it says J4 actually, but it, so elsewhere it says debug connector. And uh, when I saw that, I thought, okay, maybe we can use that to do something interesting. Um, so this project is about wire speed routing. Sorry, I'll switch back to my presentation. This project's about wire speed routing, uh, switching, etc., cetera, um, filtering, doing all kinds of uh, interesting network protocol stuff at wire speed. So NetFPJ 1G has a PCO interface, 40 pin debug connector firmware is written in Verilog and all reference designs and many contributor designs are fully open source using a BSD style license. So that's another reason why I, um, I chose this particular platform for uh, coming up with a proof of, proof of concept for our switch. Um, the second Xilinx FPGA which manages a PCI interface uh, requires Xilinx. Um, IP, intellectual property. Um, so there's a core that needs to be um, included in your designs if you actually want to modify what goes into that FPGA, uh, which needs to be built against Xilinx's... Um, uh, you need to pay for um, access to their IP to do that. Pretty much everything on the other FPGA is open source. Um, but the tools required to generate the bit files for the FPGAs are also proprietary and they need licenses and if you work at a university that's not too hard. Um, you get cheap prices and all that sort of stuff. In fact this board, which you can't see, this board um, for a university uh, customer is half the price of what it would cost for a commercial customer so uh, we pay something like $600 for it but um, somebody else working in industry might have to pay twice that. So it's accessible to us, but um, uh, we do still require some proprietary tools, which is a bit of a, a bit of a problem for me. There's a picture of the. Uh, there's a board. There's a board in a box. Um, there's an FPGA showing the four one gig um, interfaces and memory on the PCI bus to host CPU. Over the other side is some software stuff. So they've got a router, reference router design, and a reference. Um, switch design, which was what was it, the reference switch design was what was interesting for my project. And they've also got a GUI um, written in Java, which you can also click on to do stuff to interact with the router. Okay, the, um, I was trying to extract a picture of how this uh, the um, reference design looks internally, but I couldn't get it, so I'm just going to quickly discuss it. There's a single 64-bit data path through the FPGA uh, in their reference design. And so there's a multiplexer at one end of this data path which chooses um, packets coming in or frames, Ethernet frames coming in from one of the four gigabit uh, max. And then it processes those. Uh, the actual 64-bit data path has eight bits of um, extra data attached to each, each um, data word which tells you which, uh, which channel you're talking about at, each t at any time. And uh, the data flows through and uh, you can apply all kinds of um, uh, filters or whatever inside the FPGA using a 125 megahertz clock. And so the packets generally move through fairly quickly and you'll start seeing data coming out their end uh, not long after it's arrived at the input. Um, it should be tri trivial to substitute some of the gig e Mac input outputs within the reference design for the USP Max, or to actually just enhance it and instead of having four uh, inputs into the data path, having uh, six. So I decided to use NetFPGA1G's development platform for building the initial USB 2 uh, gigabit E switch. And uh, last year I also got to go to the NetFPGA Summer Camp 2012. And wearing a t-shirt. Um, sorry. sorry, interrupt any time for questions sorry. by the way. I'm I don't quite understand what you're trying to get to with USB versus, uh, versus Ethernet switching. How are they 
So getting closer to that, but um, so this okay yeah uh, yeah okay. Uh, it's a question is why why are we even bothering putting USB on a gigabit switch um, yeah. implementation? And I, I, I did miss some. Thanks for asking that question, Martin. I did miss some some key information. So these these um, ARM system on chips are designed for mobile devices, and mobile devices rarely require a wide network interface, so they don't have them. They do have USB 2. So if you want to get data in and out of these low cost, low power ARM devices, you have a number of options, but USB 2 is probably the fastest option. Some of them have built in Wi-Fi, but building a cluster out of Wi-Fi devices. Um, so if you were to draw your missing diagram, it would be a box with a chip, four USB ports fanning into a single gig -E with a switch in between joining this, yeah. So, so okay. So back up a bit. So these system on chips are running Linux. Linux has support for USB 2 networking. So these USB 2 devices are looking to the Linux kernels on the system on chips as if they were network interfaces. When packets arrive there, they enter the switch fabric on the NetFPJ in this case as if they'd come off a an Ethernet port, but in this case they've actually come across a, a USB link, which the kernel thinks is talking to a, a, a network port, but it's actually going straight into the switch without actually ever touching um, the, the Category 5 or Category 6 cabling. So, yeah, the, the thing is USB 2 is the only practical So some of them have PCIe as well, but um, it would, when the idea first came up, the USB 2 was basically what the, the, common, the common sort of answer. The Tegra, the Tegra 2 has PCIe as well, but um, USB 2 was the initial common sort of interconnect. And and there's nothing about this design which is limiting it to systems on chips or anything else. You could plug a PC into a USB port and it would just come up as a, a device on the network as well. That current board's got more than you need Yes. No. It's just I'm just using it as a as a plat development platform for uh, for the interface which so the interface is this little dude here. The diagram you had before the, the, the This is the actual um, interface we're talking about and it just sits on top of that uh, debug connector and it has two in this case it's got two USB ports and um, yep, we'll talk about that in a moment is there another question? Funny. So the some of the two, there's two types of memory, and one of them is being used f as um, pseudo content addressable memory for the MAC address lookups for the switch fabric. So as the packets arrive, destination address needs to be looked up quickly in that memory using a hash function, um, all, done, all included with the FPJ as part of their standard switch reference design. So I don't have to actually reproduce any of that. It's all open source, very log, ready to go. Um, so all I'm doing is really feeding network packets in as if they've come across the Giga interfaces, but they're actually coming in through the USB 2. Um, so with, with, with this summer camp I attended, we had to do a project, and uh, one of the things that I learnt very early on is that um, there's this 64-bit data path, or 8-byte data path. Uh, the frames arrive from Ethernet and just go straight through this data path. The first header in an Ethernet frame is the Ethernet header, which is generally 14 bytes, or it could be 18 if it's got VLAN tags. But it's not a multiple of six to, uh, of eight; it's um, a multiple of two. And so, what that means is that all the data that comes after that is misaligned. So, all of your, in particular, your um, your source MAC address, your source IP address, and destination IP address, all the things you require for routing and stuff, is all um, skewed across these eight-byte words that are going through. And so I thought, well, why don't we just add two bytes to the front of the, he of the frames before they arrive? So the Ethernet header now is magically 16 bytes with these two, two dummy bytes at the front. And then all of the IP frames and everything else was all now falling on the 8-byte boundaries. And so I spent most of the week implementing that, implementing it at the max for the GIGI, implementing it for the pseudo interfaces that come across the PCI. Um, implementing this, updating the reference router and reference switch design so that they actually now don't have to muck around. There's, lo there's lots of code in the uh, reference switch design 
um, to do with realigning data which is coming through 8 bytes all skewed and I could actually get rid of a lot of that code um, by just adding these extra two bytes to the front and the, the two bytes are automatically removed when, the, um, when you get to the other end of the data path before the, the packets go back out to the output max we take the two bytes back out again so what goes back onto the Mac is just um, the actual Ethernet frame so that was pretty good fun. Um, they had never thought of it. I don't know why. It seemed pretty obvious to me straight away, but um, it worked. Um, we didn't manage to do any metrics to see whether it made any difference to anything, but certainly it made the code look a lot simpler. Um, the other NetFPGA, so I'm just doing a bit of a sidetrack into NetFPGAs away from my project for a moment. Um, the 10G card will be the focus of this year's summer camp at um, Stanford University, and hopefully I might get to go to that as well. Um, the 1G build infrastructure is all based on Python and Perl scripts. Um, uh, can build the whole thing, it can run a whole lot of regression tests and do all sorts of stuff. Unfortunately the, uh, the 10G card is based on a Vertex 5 FPGA and Xilinx don't support the same build tools, the command line driven build tools. This has been a major stumbling block for the NetFPGA project and they've had to, um, to rely much more on the uh, proprietary GUI based development environment and they're sort of trying to move a lot of the uh, code that was written for the 1G card across to this new environment for the 10G card. It's not really that new these days, it's a few years old but, but um, it's hard for them to transfer it all across. The other thing is, is that the, uh, the 10G card doesn't have the 40 pin debug connector on it so uh, it, ca it can't easily be used in the same way as a development platform. And I've got lots of ideas for projects to use on either of the boards, the, t the 10G or the 1G boards. Excuse me. Wrong keyboard. I suppose keyboard. Okay. Okay, so this little interface board, which I very briefly showed you, is what this talk's actually about. Um, so it's <coughs> sitting on the debug connector, it's got two micro USB connectors, and then it's got these two. Um, Cypress uh, easy USB chips on it now. Uh, and there was, a, you might have seen a lead which brings power that needs 2.5 and 3.3 volts, neither of which come across the USB interface. So the 2.5 volts and 3.3 volts come off the NetFPGA board, but they don't come through the debug connector. There's only two USB 2 interfaces which is enough to do a ping pong test and stuff but not to realise the full four port design which we want to get to. And we're up to version two and a half. Version one was a bit of a disaster. Um, version one uses Cypress uh, USB 2 transceiver called a ULPI, Ultra USB 2 Low Pin Count Interface, um, which is basically a serial interface engine. So this is the version 0 0.1 board and uh, I'll zoom closer in on that so anyway it's got those two little tiny surface mount chips there which we sold with a, hand, with a uh, hot air gun all the pins are underneath them there's no pins there are just uh, ball grid type things and the debug connector and the two USB interfaces and uh, I think Bunny touched on the problems with this during his talk. Uh, it basically relies on implementing most of the USB protocol stack in FPGA code. Um, there are some implementations available, especially on the Open Cores website, the open FPGA type work that people have been doing. But it was still going to be a huge amount of work uh, implementing an interface using those serial interface engines and then putting all of the USB code into uh, the FPGA. So we could have bought some IP cores for using with that, but we uh, instead I decided at some point to go back and try a new design. So I reread the specifications for the Cypress FX2 LP, otherwise known as Easy USB devices. Um, when I first read them, I realised I had an 8051 microcontroller. And I thought, well, that's just going to be a bottleneck. I didn't even read any further when I when I saw that. What I didn't read was that it actually has these FIFOs and the main data paths can bypass the 8051 and go directly from the, uh, from the USB network 
and out some pins to whatever device comes next. And so fairly trivial to use those devices instead. Uh, and so the version 0.2 card has two of those. Um, however, what I forgot was that the USB 2, uh, the easy USB chips use 3.3 volt logic and the uh, FPGA, I thought it was, like, was able to do 3.3 from previous work, but in fact it's, it's um, been hardwired on this particular board to use 2.5 volt logic and so it would have been dangerous to have actually turned it on. Uh, not dangerous in the sense of causing anyone any harm, but it may have damaged the FPGA. So that board was a dud and we went to version 0 0.3, put the missing level converters in, also reorganised the data path, so instead of having a separate 8-bit data path for each of the two uh, USB chips, we've now got a single 16-bit data path and they share it. So whichever one's got data that's available can get it off the chip much quicker and into the FPGA, uh, but you need to, um, to share. You have to share anyway because the data paths are bi-directional, so data going in one direction will have to be shared with data going the other direction on the same bus. Now I'm just sharing it four ways instead of two ways. And um, we clock the data through at 41.66 megahertz, which is the reference design's 125 megahertz clock divided by three. And that gives us 83 megabytes per second aggregate across to the two USB 2 interfaces, which is plenty. The version 0.1 board was developed using Eagle. So I'm now cutting across to hardware design. This is what I was saying. This, this project involves lots of different aspects. Um, so when I did the version 0.1 board, which is here, I used the popular Eagle software, which is free as in beer, but not free as in speech. And, um, you know, got that sorted out. We got the boards fabricated by Seed Studios Fusion Service uh, over in China. And they had, they had some good information online about how to use Eagle to um, prepare, prepare the Gerber files and stuff for their service. Um, but subsequently I used Getter on a different project I was working on. Getter is the GNU electronic design automation tool set. Um, it's using a schematic capture program called GSCAM and a PCB layout program called PCB. And it's sometimes called GAF, um, GSCAM and Friends. Um, so having used Getter on this other project, when I had to do the version 0.2 board, I decided to go back and use Getter for that instead of Eagle because I felt uneasy using Eagle and I love Getter. Um, there are some anachronisms using Getter. Um, in particular, the key combinations you use to do panning and zooming in the schematic capture program are quite different to the, um, the key combinations you need to do panning and zooming in the PCB program and so if you're switching back and forth as you often do, you um, do a bit of layout and then realise you've got to change some pins in your schematic or whatever, um, you've got to keep switching your mindset from one uh, set of key combinations to another which is frustrating but you get used to it. Um, what's really nice is that both GSCAM and PCB write easily understood ASCII text files. There's nothing hidden, it's not proprietary data formats like the Eagle programs use. Um, and what's more, you can easily run scripts through these ASCII text files and like change drill sizes for all of the capacitors from 0 0.6 to 0 0.8 or something like that really easily. And I think you can actually do inside this, the GSCAM programs and stuff as well, but I just got used to just quitting out of GSCAM running some, um, running some uh, scripts across the files, doing a bit of text editing with VI, whatever, and fixing things up that way and then running it back up again to see that it was all good. Um, with using GSCAM and PCB, there's probably less library symbols available, so you need to lay out more library symbols of your own. I think even if you're using a program like Eagle, it's not a bad idea to use your own library symbols um, because you don't ever know for sure whether the ones that are coming in are um, as accurate as what you might need. That's my point of view anyway. So I did have to go and, and redo the, um, the footprints for some of the chips that I'm using because uh, the ones that were available weren't uh, quite what I wanted. <coughs> Anyway, so I'm totally going to use Jetta from now on. Uh, the other one I need to look at is KiCad, which is uh, another open, fully open source um, electronic design tool. 
But if you want to talk to me about using Getter, G-Scan, PCB, etc., afterwards, I'm quite happy to talk about that um, at some more length. Okay, so looking at the software, um, there's basically three areas that need development. There's the kernel module to, um, to find the USB interface. There's the code that f runs on the 8051 microcontroller on the uh, easy USB devices. And there's the Verilog code, which is, the Verilog code is by far the, uh, the most complicated part of it for the NetFPGA. So looking at the Linux kernel module, um, so we're using Linux kernels. Uh, the trick is to make the USB network interface look like an existing supported USB network device. Not so much so that it actually mistakes it for a different one, but, but just use all the same um, code sort of base. Um, I use the Axis drivers as the, uh, the base for my driver, and in particular the AX88178, which is a gigabit network USB to interface. Um, the easy USB devices can boot firmware from one of three areas. Going back to Bunny's talk today, um, they actually have a little bit of firmware in them which you'd never get to touch, which can um, download the firmware for the 8051 either across the USB bus or from a EEPROM or a flash ROM chip. And uh, if you put the right if you have an EEPROM chip in there, you may not want to keep reflashing the code onto it all the time. So they've got this extra mode where if you put a particular uh, byte sequence in the beginning of it, and then you can put your own custom USB um, manufacturer ID, and, or vendor ID I should say, and device ID in that, then the kernel when you plug it in will see that and run up the bootloader. <coughs> the bootloader can then find the file on disk, download it across USB into the easy USB device, and then the USB device uh, can do a thing called re renumeration. Um, I think renumeration is a trademark. Yes, renumeration is a trademark, but it renumerates. I think I can say you renumerates that same trademark. Uh, oh, here we go. So firmware. I've just said all that. Uh, firmware can then renumerate the USB. So it basically shuts down the USB and starts it up again, makes it look like you've just unplugged it and plugged it back in again. But now it's got a new vendor ID and device ID. And this time um, it should trigger the kernel to bring up the USB network device driver that you've loaded. <coughs> so the code for the uh, 8051 is developed using small devices C compiler, SDCC. Uh, it's different to GCC. It does some stuff differently, especially if you have um, strings and stuff that need to be pre-initialized. It actually goes and writes code that loads bytes into memory to initialize strings, which is just bizarre. I don't know why they don't just cut and c copy stuff from uh, from the code space into the uh, data space, but they actually write code that goes and puts the right values into the pre-initialized arrays. And stuff like that. It doesn't really matter because it only gets run once at boot time and then virtually does nothing else after it's initialized. All the rest of the data is passing directly through the FIFOs into the FPGA. But yeah, this SDCC is interesting. The Verilog code. Um, it's intended to work within the NetFPGA reference design framework, specifically the, uh, it's called the NF2, the NetFPGA2 framework. Um, uses Python scripts for building and testing the Verilog, can simulate on a Linux host, so they, all their development was done on um, Fedora-based devices, and um, they have a complete simulation environment there. But it's, it's again using proprietary Xilinx tools which do run on Linux. And then they have a synthesize environment to uh, download the code across PCI onto the FPGA on the NetFPGA card. Um, in order to do the simulation, I would have to build a model of the NetFPGA to USB 2 interface and get it all right in order to be able to do the simulations. And I'm trying to avoid that, so at the moment I'm just relying on synthesizing the designs, passing it down and using debugging techniques on the 8051 devices to see whether or not I'm getting the right responses. But I think maybe I might have to end up um, building those models and putting them into the simulation environment. Uh, Somebody tell me what the time is. I've still got, I've got a bit more. Um, so the Vertex 2 chip has um, things called clock domains. There are eight clock domains. 
Um, it uses one for its transmit clocks across all of the devices, so that's 125 megahertz clock. But for each of the receive Macs, so the four gigabit networks um, ha each have their own receive Mac, and they have to be clocked separately because you don't, you can't guarantee what um, you know what the other end is doing in terms of pushing the data through. So there's five clocks <coughs> of your eight used up. Then there's a couple of clocks required for SATA. I think one for DRAM. Well, maybe it's two for DRAM and one for SATA. Anyway, there's no spare clocks available <coughs> for my um, for my interface. So what I'm doing is I'm actually using the 125 megahertz clock and dividing that by three to give me the 40 to give me a 41.66 megahertz clock for clocking the FIFOs. The FIFOs are allowed to be clocked up to 48 megahertz. So I'm losing a little bit there, but um, it's close enough that uh, that. I'm not too worried about it. If I need it, I can take another clock away from one of the uh, unused gigabit net network ports. Yeah. No silly question. Yeah. Why, no does silly Why does an FPJ have SATA on it? Yeah. Um, they use SATA as a interconnect. If you want to have multiple FPJ cards in a computer, you can actually join them together with SATA and pass data between them really fast. Yeah. Yeah. I, 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 um, I have seen, so there's lots of contributed code in FPJ, and I have seen a couple of codes that use the SATA interface for doing that. I've never seen anyone use it for like storing data on something. But I suppose you could if you wanted to buffer pack, you know, keep a log of stuff or whatever, you could perhaps squirt it straight out into a SATA device, but you'd have to build file systems and all sorts of stuff, wouldn't you? <coughs> so my very log code, after it's got the clock right, the next thing it has to do is arbitrate between the four data sources, so the two inputs or two outputs that are on those two two USB interfaces and multiplex all that data into this 64-bit data path and again it's going to add the um, the two byte buffer the two byte um, padding to the front so that as the um, as the packets come in off USB and hit the uh, the NetFPGA switch reference framework they'll all be lined up nicely um, using a round robin scheduler so just looks through which FIFO is ready to do something and then moves all the data out of that um, so there'd be a little bit of latency there, but not too much. I have it all modelled somewhere. Um, the other thing that the Verilog code needs to do then is to deframe. So we have multiple, eth we can have up to 90 odd Ethernet frames packed into one uh, US, uh, USB 2 transfer. Uh, and so they need to be deframed once they hit the FPGA, because the FPGA is only dealing with Ethernet frames. So uh, the Verilog code needs to be able to read through the, um, the chains of <coughs> headers and take each Ethernet frame out and present them through to the FPGA, to the NetFPGA switch reference design uh, one by one. And similarly, when there's um, frames coming through that need to go back, uh, we need to repacketize those. And there's a bit of timing involved there to know just how many is repacketized. Uh, so there's a bit of... Bit of um, work to be done there yet. It's not working yet, by the way, if you're wondering. It doesn't work yet. Um, so I'm trying really hard to keep it all free and open. Uh, here I am presenting on a, uh, on a, a Mac OS box. I apologise for that, but uh, anyway. Um, I'm trying really hard to use FOSS tools. Um, sometimes, the, for example, switching from Eagle to Getter, uh, there are people around our area who use Eagle who can help, but uh, no one using Getter. Actually, Eric arrived just a while ago and he's used it, so he can help. Um, yeah, so so it's a bit of a cost. It's probably slowed down a bit, of, a, a bit the development um, process to use the FOSS tools, but I think at the end it's, it's um, made for a much better design and something that's much easier to share with other people. <coughs> so as long as FPGA synthesis tools remain the the one area of proprietariness in the development environment, as well as the IP core for doing the PCI interface. And I'd love to, uh, to uh, talk to anyone who knows about um, open source FPGA synthesis tools. Maybe, Bunny, do you know anything about that or no? Um, yeah, yeah. And so almost there for a complete FOSS hardware FPGA development, but not quite. Uh, I need to gain some expertise in a wide range of areas. So I've, you know, circuit design, which I've been doing for a long time. Um, very log design. I've done it a while ago, but um, my brain sort of got a lot of it. So uh, relearning a lot of there. 
um, getting up to speed on all of these Python build scripts and um, etc. Lots of things I've had to get expertise in. Project's not finished. Still more software to develop. And there's some links. And that is a very quick run through. Questions? Do you want the mic? Do you want to? Um, do you think the open source community needs to um, build one of these USB um, uh, UPL compatible um, cores so that projects like yours can um, use it? I think um, the open source community needs to build lots of open source cores. So a PCI, a PCI core would be a fantastic one to have. Um, the F, the NetFPGA used to use uh, IP core for the Max for the gigabit networking, but um, someone from San Diego contributed, well, people working at university there contributed an open Mac for the um, for the Broadcom chip, which meant that we now have no proprietary IP on the main FPGA. It's all completely open. Everything. Every byte that's running on it is now open, but you still need the proprietary tools to compile them. So yeah, I, I mean yeah, people should contribute their cores. So this, the whole the whole um, culture of of uh, FPGA design seems to be around this whole whole idea of IP. It's built into the names. It's all called IP. So everywhere you go, it's all about somebody owns this design, and you need to pay them if you want to use it, sort of thing. And I really want to try and get away from it. On the uh, embedded micro sides, the Tigra 3s or whatever, uh, would you be using uh, channel bonding on the Ethernet to actually so you can get the, the performance out of your, your Ethernet interfaces? And also, um, if you're going to do that, you would need to make certain you use the right protocol on the, your Ethernet switch side to correctly load balance the packets across the link. So I haven't thought about channel bonding at all. The, the intention is to have one USB port per Tegra CPU. I um, haven't, haven't actually considered whether you'd need more bandwidth. But as far as I know, the Tegra CPU's only got a single USB controller, so bonding wouldn't... bonding the USB wouldn't get you anything. If you could bond it with a different... some other interface that's available, you might get some extra. But the Tegra 2 itself only has a single USB channel. Luke. So I wonder who this twit was who designed the net FPGA, FPGA board and uh, didn't expose any power rails on the debug header. So um, well, I'd, I'd be really wary of calling any of the people in the FPGA team twits, um, but. Uh, I've never seen anything that uses the, F the debug connector. The debug connector is just there, and I've never seen a single reference to anyone do anything at all with it in terms of presenting information. So they may have used it internally just to check that things are working right. But um, it's got ground, so there's six ground pins. It's got two clocks, and it's got 32, or two, the two clocks are for FPGA. They're called clocks, but I think they're no different to any other pin. And there's 32 other pins. Um, I guess if you're debugging, you don't actually want the FPGA board to be powering the bug system. Yeah. Well, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so I may have kind of zoned out in some section. Is it possible to use this um, in like OpenFlow with talking over the USB for doing using the net FPJ for like fast routing and fall back through the USB so a question about openflow yes you could certainly use openflow on it once it's all working um, there's no different it, it, as far as the rest of the framework is concerned it will see no difference between packets arriving on the gigabit max and packets arriving on the USB max going through the um, the D <coughs> demultiplexing process These are the wires that were being referred to, by the way. This we uh, connected to two points on the board where there's 2.5 and 3.3 volts power. So all the switching is in the FPGA. It's not open V switch or 
any of that sort of stuff. This is all written from scratch in Verilog. Yep. <laughs> all right. This will need to be the last question. Um, just curious about the, the fact the compiler for the FPGA is proprietary. Is there anything inherently hard about that? Like, is the spec, are the specs for the FPGA proprietary or could somebody write a Verilog to Xilinx compiler and they just haven't? So people have been discussing writing um, no, it's writing open, well, alternatives to... It's clear... I mean, Xilinx aren't the only FPGA supplier and they all require you to use their own um, tools for developing the bit file, the, the synthesis tools. Um, there's clearly information in those bit files which they're scared of their competitors finding. There's something in there which is going to reveal some trick they're doing inside their FPGAs or something which they're trying to keep for themselves. Because at the end of the day, they're selling the silicon. It's very hard for somebody else to sell their silicon. So I can't see what they've got to lose by making the specifications, the bit files completely open. But clearly, they feel that if they did that, they would lose something. I'm not sure what. But there's all sorts of cleverness going on. There's like some of these IP cores, they will automatically disable themselves after so many hours of use. So there's obviously things going inside the FPGA which can time how long a particular core has been running for and then turn it off. And it's like, you know, there's all this built in designed for, you know, do you, what's, what's that? Uh, um, what's that website? Anyway, bad design type stuff. Where uh, it's not in your favourites. Uh, um, we're out of time. Everybody's fine. Design is fine. We're out of time, so we'll just please thank Robert for giving a speech. Thank you. On behalf of LCA, I'd just like to present you. Then.